Now we're going to talk about yet another awesome property of waves. Suppose I have a bunch of particles being emitted by a source. And now there's a screen over there. And imagine when the particles hit those screen, hit that particular screen, that screen starts glowing. The region where it hits starts glowing. Now suppose in the path of those particles, if I introduce a slit, like an obstruction with a small opening, what do you think is going to happen? Well, you will say that's pretty obvious what's going to happen, right? Well, because there's a blockade, only a few particles are going to go through, and so the region which is illuminated by, this, uh, by the particles, the screen which gets illuminated, it's going to become now smaller. Pretty obvious. And I'm going to ask you what happens if I make the slit even narrower? Well, you will say, big deal! Well, since it becomes even narrower, only small opening opening is there because of which the particle only fewer particles are going to now go through, and so even a smaller region of screen is going to get illuminated. That's boring, not a big deal. Okay, fine. Now suppose that the source was not a source of particles, but it was a source of waves. So imagine now these rays indicate direction of wave propagation. And I again have a screen which gets illuminated by this particular wave. And I again introduce a slit, a blockhead with a small opening. And I'm again going to ask you what's going to happen. And you will say, well, maybe same thing, right? No. Now things are going to change. In fact, it's going to become a little crazy now. You see what these waves are going to do now is instead of now illuminating a smaller region of screen, these waves are going to now bend around this corner and it's going to now illuminate even more of the screen. Huh? That, that makes no sense. Yeah, well that's what waves can do. And that tells you how different waves are when it comes to particles. And that's not it. Now comes something even more crazy. Suppose I make the slits narrower. What do you think is going to happen? Well, if I make the slits narrower, the waves are going to bend even more and even more region of the screen is going to get illuminated now. That is an awesome property of waves. And this property of waves is what we call as diffraction. So what is diffraction? Waves have an amazing property which allow them to bend around that corner. You can see over here is one bending and there is one bending. So this ability of waves which allow them to bend around the corner, that is what we call as diffraction. And diffraction is not uncommon at all. For example, here is an example where water waves are being diffracted. Clearly you can see that plane waves are entering and they're being diffracted away. You can hear diffraction. Yeah, sound is a wave, and so diffraction happens in sounds as well. To give you an example, uh, imagine you are inside a room, and outside your favorite show is going on, and you are asked to sit in, in the room and study, and the door is closed. Now what you can do is open the door a little bit, and you'll be able to hear most of the sound now. Well, that's because when you open the door a little bit, these sound waves are going to enter through that small opening and they're going to diffract. And so diffraction can be seen in sound as well. But guess what? Light is also a wave. And therefore, light must also share this awesome property of diffraction. And that's what we're going to see in the subsequent videos. But now comes the big question, why do waves do that? Why do waves have this unique diffraction property, which is not there in particles? Can it be somehow explained? Oh yeah, Huygen can do that. And so we're going to see how Huygen's model can explain diffraction. Okay, so now we are going to talk about diffraction. Oh uh, well, why do waves spread out? Well, it can be explained by going back to the concept of Huygens wave principle. Now suppose we have some incoming waves, which is like uh, consider incoming parallel waves, like so. So let the source be at infinity. Then we know that the wave fronts are always perpendicular. So the wave front for this one 
would look somewhat like this. It would be a plane wave, we call this. And how did Huygens tell us how to calculate what's going to be the shape of the next wave front? Well, you have to imagine that every point on this current wave front is a source of, uh, is a new Huygens source. And then you have to take your protractor, or oh, <laughs> compass, you take your compass, and then you have to set the radius to whatever uh, radius you want. So the radius is going to be always C delta T, where delta T is the time after which you want to calculate your new wave front. So here is that radius, and C is the speed of light. If it's in vacuum, it's going to be C. If it's in any other medium, it's going to decrease. So you set that radius, and then draw the new spherical wave front. All right, nothing new in this, and then draw draw a common tangent to them, and that would give you your new wave front. And so the new wave front looks exactly like the way it was before. So regardless of what shape you have as a wave front, as long as it's free to propagate, the new wave front looks exactly similar to the previous one. It's just enlarged. If it's plane, it looks exactly the same. If you have a circular wave front or a spherical wave front, it just becomes bigger and a bigger circle. We've seen that before. Now all this is fine because if it's 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 always infinitely big, and if you have infinitely big, you will always have infinite number of these sources, and this will never be ending, and so the common tangent will also never end, and the shape looks like the way before. But now what happens when we encounter an obstacle? Suppose we encounter a slit. So let me draw a slit somewhere. All right. Let's say here is a slit. Yeah. Okay. Now the question is, what's going to happen? Well, until the wave hits the slit, same thing is going to happen. So I will have continuing parallel wave fronts, which I'm not going to do. I mean, I'm not going to keep on doing the uh, the protracted thing again and again. It's just going to come and hit the parallel wave fronts until it hits the source. Now, once it hits the source, what's going to happen is a little bit interesting. Now I have few Huygen sources over here. And what you can see is that not all the Huygen sources survive. Only few Huygen sources survive. And so now again, when I draw my new spherical wave front, I'm going to keep the distance large this time. It's going to look like this over here here and here so now what does the common tangent look like now the common tangent looks like this see what has happened the plane wave has now been transformed into sort of a diverging wave so now the next wave from we can sort of guess it goes out this way and next wave from we go like so and the next one like so and the next one like so. Therefore, if I were to draw now the direction of the propagation, I have to always draw the lines parallel, I mean perpendicular to the wave fronts. So here is the initial green wave front which I would draw. Uh, sorry, here is the green, initial green uh, incident waves that I would draw, incident rays of di rays of light. And now afterwards, it's going to go like this. Look at that. I have to draw always perpendicular. So the waves are actually spreading out there it is and that is the whole concept behind diffraction so it's amazing how a simple Huygens principle can explain a rather complicated phenomena so as such as diffraction and try to use the particle model and you see particle model horribly fails over here particle model has no clue how to deal with diffraction now what is interesting again which goes against your intuition is that if you make this slit smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, fewer and fewer and fewer Huygens sources survive, and therefore the wave looks more and more circular. Or in other words, the wave spreads out more or the wave diffracts more. So if, for example, I have, let's say, a slit which is so, so tiny and so 
very, very, very small. Let's say it's only like, you know, this big. Very tiny. Then, by the time the plane waves would reach over here, so here is the plane waves which are incoming, it comes and hits over here. Now, only very few amount of hydrogen sources survive over here. I'll just draw one. And so, if I draw only one hydrogen source, then I have to use my compass and draw a new spherical wave over here. And look, the only thing that survives now is a spherical wave. And therefore, the entire wave, plane wave, now becomes a spherical wave. And you see a huge diffraction over here compared to what you see over there. Here, it still has some plane component. But here, everything has now been converted into spherical, which means diffraction is at its maximum. Of course, you can never have a slit which is so small that only one Huygen source survives. That's just an approximation, by the way. So we, we can basically say that as the slit size approaches zero, the wave approaches perfect spherical waves. That is the amazing idea behind diffraction. So diffraction can only be explained by using the wave model. And if light is a wave, well, then light should obey diffraction.